Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Uh, we are on today with Dapper Dinosaur again. And hello. <laughs> hello. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing wonderfully. You're my favorite theropod. Did you know Why, that? Why, thank you. I mean, there's a big field out there. Like, there's Big Bird and uh, Rexy from the Jurassic Park franchise. And um, the parrot from Aladdin. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad All I right, won out over enough. those. I mean, one is voiced by by Gilbert Gottfried, so that is a hard that is a hard uh, hill to top. But you made it, Dapper. Well, uh, that so. is a, quite the honor. Yeah. So, and then we also have our guest, which is uh, Paleo Logos. Uh, which I guess I didn't ask in advance. Do you want Peter Paleo Logos? Which would you prefer? Yeah, you can call me Peter if you want. All right. Well, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Great. Thanks so much for having me on. Great to talk with you. Absolutely. Uh, well, for anyone who is uh, not familiar with you, perhaps, can you give us a bit of a background on yourself? Yeah, so I am a young Earth creationist, and I run a relatively small YouTube channel called Paleologos, where I mainly discuss human evolution, hominins, and creationism. So um, I'm an avid a uh, studier of paleoanthropology, as you can probably tell from all the schools behind me. Um, and yeah, I, I really enjoy this particular science. Awesome. Yeah, you come at it from a very interesting and unique, a largely unique angle, uh, at least in the YouTube community, in terms of, of young earth creationism, uh, because you don't simply lie about all the fossils. So that's a, a very positive uh, you know, upside. Like, uh, you, what, what, uh, the first video that I found, uh, of yours was the one where you critiqued, um, Genesis apologetics, where they yes. were trying to argue that Lucy was a quadruped. Very well done. Um, <laughs> I watched that and I was like, yeah, I agree with absolutely everything he's saying. I know you and Erica talked about that. And yep. That was also um, my yeah, first introduction. I, I think that's, yep. that's really an issue there where we have this kind of break where even, you know, creationists and evolutionists can disagree can, can totally agree on something i mean yeah mm -hmm. that's definitely shows that you know some people are definitely kind of making up some things about the fossils and just not being honest it's completely yeah i i am um, i'm not sure if you have uh, we or you mentioned them a little bit ago but um have you had a lot of interactions with like the standing for truth group um i haven't had too much with them i I just only recently kind of become aware of them and kind of, you know, spoken with Donnie. Well, I'll bit. give you a hint as to their level of education when it comes to things like uh, hominid anatomy. They said that one of the differences between humans and apes is that apes have two arm or two bones in their upper arm, whereas humans only have one. <laughs> well, I also have a, a well, yeah, so, I, I thought it was interesting that last debate um, between, let's see, who was it, Jackson Rowe and Donnie? Oh, they brought yeah. Donnie brought up as evidence the hyoid bone and mentioned that humans are the only one to have the hyoid bone. Oh no, which, which no, isn't, which is no, that's not true. Isn't that that's, true? That's like mammal wide as having a hyoid bone. Like yeah, that's, well, yeah, it's also in like, bones. It's also in amphibians, reptiles, and birds. Yeah, I mean it's so it's just tetrapods basically everywhere. broadly, yeah. basically. Yeah. That's amazing. amazing. See, I, I think I run a very close line because on the one side, because I am a young earth creationist, my goal is not to cause division or dissent among sure. others. And on the other hand, I also think that some people are misrepresenting the fossil record. So sure. I, I want to be clear that I'm not against standing for truth or these other creationists that I've, I've critiqued. I mean, I, I certainly think there are, some of them are uh, not not being clear about the evidence, but I, I want to be clear that I'm not trying to cause dissent or division among creationists. That's not my goal. Oh, I mean, sure. I mean, well, at the same time, though, any time that that you are, you know, that, that there are, um, uh, what would you call them? Like, uh, I guess, fancies that are widely enjoyed, and this happens among atheists, too, and I'll be the first to admit it. 
things, you know, there are really bad historical um, arguments, things like that, um, that which, which come from atheist circles. And mm -hmm. so be yeah, going out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so going out, you know, going out there and, and correcting people, you're not always going to make friends. Precisely. Right. But, but you're right. At least you can be correct about these things. And that's really what's, you know, most important. Right. Yeah. I've received a lot of negative pushback from a lot of creationists, you know, being a, being a shill of the evolutionists, apparently <laughs> right. uh, to, to admit that uh, Lucy walked upright, but yeah. How, right. how dare you be accurate about fossil taxa? That's not what Jesus would want. <laughs> and the most ridiculous thing is, right? I, I believe that God is a God of truth. And so, yeah, right. I, I've sure. even had responses from creationists about things like, well, you know, um, hominid fossils don't tend to bring people to creation. And thus, we we maybe should just shy away from talking about them. It, no, that's the it's not the approach that we should take at all. That's, that is I mean, they're, they do a pretty good job of uh, getting people to accept evolution. So yeah. I guess if you wanted to counter that, it might actually be a pretty important thing to talk about. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, a lot of creationists have brought that or sorry, evolutionists have brought that up as probably the, the single best evidence for, you know, I wouldn't you know. call it that. But I, I will say I think it's one of the most um, rhetorically compelling for like, Sure. Uh, lay yeah. audiences because i think for yeah. most people the the hang up that they're least likely to get over in terms of accepting evolution and the thing that if they got over it would most likely just say okay well i guess the whole thing's fine is human evolution even though mm -hmm. i actually don't think it's our i don't think there's any one thing that i would call the best evidence for evolution sure, sure. and yeah. it's because it's a consilience of things right but um it's certainly like i said it's it's very powerful in terms of the sort of hearts and minds of people um, not that I think that you should accept evolution into your heart. It's just a scientific theory. It's an entirely intellectual thing. But have you atoned before uh, Darwin? You know, <laughs> uh, I haven't. I'm going to go uh, do a, have a bonfire and uh, I'm going to burn copies of Lamarck uh, in honor of Darwin later on. That's, that's what be, he would want you to my do. Evening. Exactly. That and and uh, Agassiz, anything by Agassiz. You know? Oh, yeah. Just right in the pile. <laughs> um, but at any rate, yeah. Um, I do certainly appreciate that. I have read um, a bit of Wood stuff. I understand you work with Dr. Wood. Yeah. So let's see. I think for the past two years now, I've I've been working with Dr. Todd Wood. Um, yeah, we've we've been working on a lot of different biomineralogy projects. One got published so far. Yeah, absolutely. That, and that and that's really cool. You know and wherever you go, you'll have like that little that feather in your cap. And so you can say like, Hey, I've, you know, done research at so-and-so group or Institute. Right. You know, actually this reminds me, I believe I asked you specifically a question, not super long ago, which was, um, and I'm not saying I definitely need an answer right now, but I'm just wondering if you've given it any more thought, which was to say, let's say that evolution were true and you were to do bare mineralogical analyses, how would it look different than what you think you're getting right now? Mm -hmm. Well, evolutionary theory would predict that we would see, I believe, at least uh, a perfect gradient in terms of morphological features between these two groups, which are hypothetically connected by a common ancestor. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I would suggest that we wouldn't be able to, um, based on kind of holistic data, see groups as much instead we would just see kind of instead just continuous see so, that's, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, that's interesting for a couple reasons where, where i'm actually gonna somewhat disagree for one thing um i would say that that would only be true first between very closely related groups and second only if you also happen to have all the taxa that or just representatives of essentially a, mm -hmm. a much fuller amount of the diversity that existed throughout time than is likely to have been preserved. But the other thing is, um, like, if you want to get, say, um, the relationship between, say, cats and bears, you're not going to see a smooth transition between those two. You're going to get back to something that looks sort of raccoonish. And then in one direction, it's going to become more and more cat-like, and the other one's going to become more and more bear-like, while also giving rise to things like dogs and raccoons and... Um, red pandas and things like that so it's really 
not a prediction of evolution that any two related taxa will have intermediates in terms of morphology between those two. It's between any one and the basal form. And then for a related taxa, it's again between that one and again the basal form. Now, the basal form is something that you can usually recover. Uh, like, for instance, when we talk, since we're focusing a little bit on humans, you know, there are basal aspects to ape morphology, right? Like having long legs like humans is not basal to apes. To, apes overall have short legs and long arms. Well, I think um, I think for me to say anything is basal is would be somewhat of kind of buying into your own terminology because the whole idea of basal creatures is kind of reliant upon. Well, don't you have that within theory. baromenology too? I mean, you have groups yeah. that are yes, even within saying, your own clusters. But I'm saying within within your within basal morphology in terms of, for example, the leg length as you brought up in in apes. Well, I'm not necessarily trying to say like this is you have to accept these terms in in this sense i'm saying if evolution were true i don't actually think that the results that you would get from baromenology would actually differ from what you do get partially because to a large extent baromenology is based on uh i'm going to mispronounce it but there's a like phrenology phenology okay. jackson help me out that thing from like you know they were doing it in terms of evolutionary analysis back in like the 60s yeah i think that i think that's phenology right? phenology yeah okay I, I can never remember that, how to pronounce the word. Because phrenology Sorry, is, the, is like That's the, the, head the bumps thing. on your head, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, phenology. Um, yeah, phenology. And it uses yeah. a lot of the same techniques, and the reason that phenology was largely abandoned was because it had trouble disambiguating uh, relative lack of common ancestry from common ancestry. And so that's why we have things like, you know, various things like Bayesian analysis and most likely trees and things like that. And we actually do know what those things would look like without common ancestry, because as I'm sure creation myths will be happy to hear me say, we do have a significant area of, or, of, well, of biological entities that do not sh seem to share common ancestry, which is viruses. And when you try to do like a whole virus wide um, phylogenetic tree or cladogram or anything like that, mm -hmm. you basically just recover a whole host of mutually contradictory, extremely low quality in terms of likelihood uh, trees. And so we know what that looks like when there's not common ancestry. And so I, I just find that concerning that on the one hand, I don't think that you could distinguish between evolution and separate creation with baromenology. I think you have to assume uh, separate creation to come to that conclusion from the techniques and more robust techniques do not resolve uh, separate ancestry with any kind of statistical significance. But I'll shut up now because I've been monopolizing for too long. Have you seen um, like the refined Brahmin concept paper? I do not believe that I have. Okay. Uh, you, you may want to check that out. It's, it's a paper by uh, Dr. Todd Wood and uh, some others, I think Sanders and Kurt Wise and some other people. But it kind of lays out exactly what they would define a Brahmin as and kind of their prediction about what you should see. Um, in terms of whether things should fall into these clusters or not from evolution, I, I, I would still maintain that I, I don't think that would be the case because, I mean, people have, once again, going back to this idea of there being this perfect transition, you mentioned viruses where we can't really parse out the common ancestry, but you have a clear idea of what... Sorry, what? There isn't common ancestry for all the viruses. That was the point he was making. Yes. Okay, right. okay. sorry. Um, but my, my point being, in terms of hominids, you have a very clear idea of what exactly kind of things should look like morphologically because you have uh, a model that you believe exactly how this, you know, branched out phylogenies. Um, and I, I see contradictions between phylogenies and... Um, and uh, barmenological evaluations. In fact, that was actually something that kind of they predicted in that refined Brahmin concept that paper that you would actually see that uh, barmenological analyses would be able to uh, see things that phylogenies couldn't uh, because of the, the, the way that the statistical analysis works. What, what things would be seen by a barmenological analysis that a phylogenetic analysis would miss? Um... Let's see. I, I do actually have the paper pulled up right here. Um, is this the 2003 paper? Because I believe I have it pulled up too. 
Uh, yes, it is the, okay. the 2003 paper. Awesome. Yep. Um, I'll put a link to this because uh, in the chat, yeah. because I figure people might want to pull it up. So everybody, uh, there you go. It's in the chat now. You're welcome. But but I would suggest that that once again, okay. So if if evolution is true and humans are related to the Australopithecines, then we mm -hmm. should see Homo habilis, Australopithecus sediba, um, grouping very closely to the Australopithecines, and we should see Homo sapiens being further away from them because, according to uh, evolutionary phylogenetics, humans are obviously much much more different than um, you know, the Australopithecines than, than those creatures. But I, I see, in fact, humans, members of the genus Homo, all forming their own group off in the distance. But with an exception, right? Because Australopithecus sediba does fall within the human holobaramin. Correct. And I would, kind I would of suggest it should actually be called Homo so sediba, possibly. Some, something that, um, but that's kind of the the point, isn't it? Because there there are no bones, right? That Sediba has that no other Australopiths have, or any other Homo have, right? It's mm -hmm. really just comes down to there are proportions of these bones which are more in common with Homo than with other Australopiths, right? Correct. That's ultimately what. It, okay, so proportions, little features, you know, right? Different like angles. It, it might yeah, have like protrusions. slightly shorter canines or you know uh you know slightly more knee or the knees are slightly more shaped like those of homo or the pelvis is more bowl shaped or what have you right okay so i get that and i get that it clusters with homo but what i don't really understand is why that necessitates a separate um design event what about what about the the close so what about any australopith that is in the 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 other group, the Australopith group, right? Mm -hmm. What about it is impossible to go from a an Australopith with one particular set of features, these proportions, to the Sediba proportions? Do you think that that's impossible? I'm, I'm not or? even saying it's impossible. I'm just saying there is a morphological gap, and I don't think that sure. the fossils we have fill that morphological gap. Sure. Look, I'm even willing to grant that. Like, right, I've, I've been willing to grant that. But the, the issue is, I think you're kind of reifying these categories. And it's not just you, people in taxonomy do that too, and I get onto them about it also. Um, my, my issue here is, I don't get it. I don't get why there's this, this need to, to, to say that, um, well, yes, it falls with these guys, therefore they're unrelated. Like, I don't follow the logic of that argument. I get that there's clustering, that there's morphological clustering. I get that. But mm. it's a matter of proportions. And I'm willing to bet, even though I haven't looked at the data specifically, I'm willing to bet it's in terms of, like, centimeters, right? Or millimeters in terms of a lot of these proportions, right? Like, it's a, it's got canines which are millimeters shorter or, you know, the pelvis is maybe a couple millimeters shorter or something like that. And I really don't see anything about that, which yes, though it clusters with the humans more is bizarre or unusual on an evolutionary model. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not even suggesting that Australopithecus sediba, you know, that, that things couldn't have, you know, common ancestry. Okay. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that, um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. What I'm saying is that from a creationist perspective, we would expect that, okay, think about character space in terms of, you know, uh, that that paper um, mm -hmm. that God created different Brahmins, right? And so they started in different areas of what we call character space. Okay. And thus, over time, they've diversified out. And so we would expect that, yeah, creatures can diversify. Some creationists would say there's bounds to that diversification. And so these groups can't ever merge. Uh, other creationists would just say they've been created distinct enough that they haven't ever, you know, overlapped with each other. But my point mm -hmm. being, from, from, from what I understand as an evolutionary point of view, I would expect to see more of a transition. 
And okay. for me, well, my, my issue okay. is that I, I, I see a gap in the fossil record and I, I really just don't see how the fossils can are bridging that gap. And so because I see this gap, I see we have humans and we have australopiths and I, I'm not sure how. So uh, we're getting you're not familiar with what Dr. Banjo, to, are you? What if I were to tell you? Oh, well, we'll do that in one sec. I, I just okay. um, um, what if I were to tell you that there are actually morphological gaps in living organisms that even I think you would would recognize share common ancestry. Like there are certain genes for like color, for instance, where there is no continuum. You have a gene or you have a mutation in a gene and this one mutation causes a large coloration change, for instance, right? It's just a single little point mutation, but it causes a relatively large coloration change. There's no gradual change from like purple to red there. It's just it's purple and then it's red just because of this one mutation. So that's a well, gap, I would right? I would draw the line there between something that i mean like obviously if, if we're looking at kind of like single characteristics we could draw lines wherever we want right so exactly my, my problem could. is that yeah look looking at things from a ho more holistic perspective i i don't but yeah. that also kind of raises the issue of but when we look at Ooh, what the things like what you mentioned from a more holistic perspective we would see that they do in fact group together oh right again right but like i just said the things those things would group together. If you were just looking at this one particular aspect of their morphology, they would also cluster together, right? And we do get that with, that happens a lot. That's not at all unusual in nature. But uh, to Dapper's point, what he was saying, are you familiar with uh, Dr. Banjo? Are you, have you ever watched Futurama? I have not. So, I was going to play it off like he was a real doctor for a little while, Jackson. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm okay. sorry. I, I blew your cover, Dapper. My apologies. Darn it. Um, they're, so... <laughs> These two characters and and the uh, was it Doctor Farnsworth right and um, and Doctor Banjo who's a who's an orangutan and he's a creationist and they're arguing about the evolution of humans right and so um, Farnsworth keeps saying oh here's this fossil which fills this gap and um, and and uh, sure we'll do that in a sec um, uh, Banjo says aha but you failed to consider that there's a gap here and Farnsworth says oh but we have this fossil and Banjo says aha but you failed to consider this gap and they they go back and forth like this in the cartoon for like hours basically yeah there's there's an actual harp chord that comes in to signify the advance of time and suddenly there's a list of you know like 20 different hominins all of which is just progressively a little bit more basal um yeah so but and so in that that sort of yeah. vein, um, I mean, we do have we do already have like a dozen or so species of hominins, right? Way more than that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so 20 plus. Yeah. And even a century ago, we just didn't have these fossils. Well, most of them, right? A century ago, we just didn't have these. And as as time has gone on, we have progressively filled in more of the you know, quote the family tree, the hominin tree right and the the gaps have gotten smaller and smaller between these taxa does that mean there are no gaps no i don't think anyone would argue that but but they've certainly gotten a lot smaller than they were just a century ago right yeah i mean i mean that's kind of an appeal to fossils that we haven't found yet but no i'm talking about the fossils we have found no no, no i know but you're saying okay you i i think projecting kind of where you're going to go with this then is okay. that okay these present gaps that we see are going to be filled by fossils in the future not even necessarily, not necessarily yeah. the, the well, fact well, that we okay. have this whole suite of fossils already sahelanthropus orin artipithecus you know australopithecus anamensis africanus afarensis the paranthropines kinianthropus all these guys you know the various homo species we even we're even down to the point with homo sapiens where we differentiate between anatomically modern and archaic homo sapiens right that's mm -hmm. that's how how close we are um so the point that i'm making with that is we didn't have any of these fossils and then and the gap the fossil gap or the morphological gap between humans and and chimps for instance was vast and i think you could have made that argument this argument just as much then as now but the difference is we've bridged a lot of that gap 
and you're still essentially making the same argument. It seems like we'll never have every fossil. Well, just well I think the most fundamental things in, in terms of morphology haven't really been crossed, or perhaps not in terms of morphology, but, uh, for example, the origin of speech, uh, you know, well, I'll grant you that there's a lot we don't know about the origin of like speeches and languages and stuff. I've, I've done a, a tiny bit of reading. Dapper knows way more about it than I do, but you're right. You're, you're absolutely correct. There's a lot we don't know about it. There's also a lot more we do know now than we did in the past, though. Yep. We are right. We are adv advancing in these areas as you know, more hypotheses are proposed about uh, like you know, there's universal grammar theory and how do uh, like sign languages fit into the uh, evolution of language and all this other stuff, right? All these are big, important questions. Um, but but uh, even that aside, right? There's always going to be gaps. There's always going to be gaps in the record. But the point is, how many gaps do we have to fill before you'll say, okay, maybe there's some validity to this whole evolution thing? Well, I would expect to kind of at least have some of the more important things like filled. I mean, right now, for example, uh, you brought up my, my video about the hyoid bone, right? I mean, obviously, we have a very fragmentary record for that. We don't really sure. know a whole lot about that. But sure. just in terms of that, for example, I, I don't see a whole lot of evidence that Australopithecines were becoming, you know, human-like or more uh, suitable for human speech. I from from what we know so far, we've only ever found hyoid bones that are suited for human speech among humans. Well, well the, what I would in call fairness, the in fairness, there's even there's there's quite a lot of debate as to whether or not Neanderthals are capable of speech. They're, Fox P two notwithstanding, right? There have been back and forths over. Well, the basal cranium doesn't support uh, that they could speak at least as well as we do, right? And that's just in Neanderthals. That's our closest relative. And in all honesty, I've you don't really have an opinion on it. Uh, maybe you do. Um, but I, I, there, at the very I, least, there's been a lot of debate over whether or not Neanderthals could speak. And I think the jury's still out on that, if I'm not mistaken. It, as far as I know, it is. But also, I, yeah. I think it's important to remember that um, virtually no hyoid bones have been found. It's it's a handful. Right. And right. Sure. I don't think that it is fair to say that because a particular aspect of a morphological transition is not well attested that the parts that are therefore don't form an actual morphological transition. Because the thing is um, like, if we just never found a bottom jaw for say all hominids ever, but we found everything else and there was a smooth transition. And then you're like, I don't know, man, that bottom jaw, I don't see how you're ever going to get a chin or ever get, you know, the various other characteristics, like where the retromolar gap show up or not, who knows? And the answer is, yeah, who knows? But that doesn't render the rest of it invalid. And so it feels like we're... Well, we're I, I think that's only question. one aspect of it, though, because as I brought up, I mean, I, I think that is only one part of this morphological discontinuum between humans and Australopithecines. I mean, I, I think it's a good example, but there's there's obviously a, a, a host of features which set them apart, and I, I don't see those being bridged, and especially in terms of what I would view to be kind of the most important cultural aspects, you know, in terms Again, of... Again, something else with a very poor fossil record. These Sorry, things that... The, the things you're picking have very, very poor fossil records. Culture is a, is a notorious. Well, well not in terms of the, of the cranial morphology as, as in the as Oh, well, the cranial we were sure. I mean, we, once again, going back to that, I mean, that's the best fossil record we have, and we still see gaps in, in the record. The thing is, with any finite number of specimens, you will, like, it's a mathematical certainty that you will find gaps. Sure, yeah. So if you're looking for gaps, it is literally impossible for you not to find them if that's what you want. Well, the, the question, question is, is, the question isn't just gaps. The question is whether or not you can have a group that is, uh, that is closer, close, more close. The distances are closer within the group than those between the group. Okay. So what I think the, the question is, is, is it actually possible for the fossil record to provide enough transitions 
that you would accept human common ancestry on the basis of fossils? Is that even a theoretically possible thing? Because it seems like the answer is probably no, if I'm being honest. You're saying if if we found enough human fossils to... How many would like, it take to convince you right. personally, uh, Peter? A hundred more? You're saying if we could have this perfectly smooth transition between Australopithecines and humans. No, he, not necessarily. He's just saying how many would you personally, how many would it take to convince you that humans are evolved from Australopiths? Not even not even necessarily a perfect grade. Just how, what, what, in your opinion, would qualify as enough evidence? Like, let's say we had five more fossils that are actually right in where you're seeing that gap. Would that fix the problem for you? And then you'd say, well, yeah, I guess Australopithecines and humans share a common ancestry. Well, I mean, creationists have held a lot of views on this. I mean, not to mention there's there's been tons of ideas in the past about ideas like the great chain of being and things like that, obviously, right? right? Where creationists in the past uh, have thought that every single kind of possibility leading up to humans was created. So, you know, I, I'm I'm not entirely sure exactly what I would what I would say, but I, I'd say I don't. That's I don't think I don't think that that is what we see, and so I don't really think it's the well, situation so that, that we have right now. That concerns well, kind of me point. though, because yeah. what what I'm hearing from that is I don't actually have a criteria for disconfirming my idea and going with the alternate hypothesis that's being proposed. So what well, that I'm, I'm perfectly me, fine for, I, I think we have a bit of a separation here though, between um, my ideas about barmanology and, you know, my other ideas. Cause if, if, if you want to prove that, you know, break down these clusters within barmanology. Yeah. I, I'm perfectly willing to admit if we can show that, that, you know, humans and, and apes don't form this morphological discontinuum. I'm perfectly willing to accept that if that could be proved. But that's what he's asking is what would it take to convince you that that's the case? And it's and your answer, at least from what it appeared, was that you don't really have a response to that. And so Dapper's point was that it seems you have your your model, your hypothesis, but there is no way to disconfirm your hypothesis. Oh, there the only absolutely data is. As I said... It, you you show that creatures fall in these gaps, break down the groups, and that disproves the barmanology. So how much has to be done to bridge the apparent gaps from barmanology? Because I would predict that even if evolution is true, given the fact that we're never going to find every single member of any lineage, mm -hmm. that there will always be clustering between related lineages, even among ones that are related like that actually do share a common ancestor. Because one of the things we got to remember is barominology has recovered things like all felids as, you know, a common ancestor. But quite frankly, there's more diversity between felids than there is between chimpanzees and humans. Right. So it mm -hmm. seems like we've got a little bit of a crazy standard here. And also like there's well, no actual standard. It's just that there's how much... different. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, and like there's no particular standard for how close these gaps have to be before they don't really count. And um, now I base this primarily on other people who have looked over barometrological studies who are themselves in, you know, into phylogenetics and do that as for a living. And it always does seem like there are things like um, odd choices for outgrouping, uh, odd choices for character selection, odd choices for just included taxa, um, and that I've seen other people use barometrology to do things like recover all of dinosauria birds included as a bear man so it it seems like we have a technique that can give some information but it doesn't have an obvious disconfirmation uh set up and that has at least in the past and i'm, I'm not going to comment on any current work because i haven't seen all of it and i you know it's ongoing so great but has at least in the past been used with shall we say a, a massage to data set i mean we literally use the bur the data set of Dembo and Berger. So, I mean, I, I think we can kind of agree that's not the case in, oh, in I'm the not study actually disputing. Of. I'm not actually disputing that, that, that study in particular. I'm just saying uh, there's a history of odd conduct with barominology, which does not have to apply to this. But also, there seems can... to be a pretty significant problem with um, 
the ability to falsify uh, the hypothesis of separate ancestry within. I can give knowledge. you an example. For instance, uh, are you familiar with like Imeran's paper on uh, Cassiids? I'm not. Uh, they're an early synapsid group, and so mm -hmm. there are I think it's six genera, no something like that. Um, and he excluded a few of them simply because the the fossils weren't. It wasn't like a complete skeleton, right? There were some remains. Uh, but it wasn't total. And then for his out group, he used like, uh, it was like Eothyrus or something. Some other synapsid group, which is like very derived compared to the Cassians. Right. And so it's like, okay, well, yeah, sure. These group together compared to this other guy, but what, wh what does that matter? Right. Like no one, literally no one's disputing that there is this morphological discontinuity between the few fossils you've chosen to represent over here and this other guy, like that's, yeah, I mean, clearly. Um, and same, I think with, uh, was it the Tyrannosauroids? I think there was a paper on that uh, where like Tyrannosauroidy was found as a, a single baromen. But at the same time you have, as Dapper mentioned, uh, Phil Center, who's a paleontologist used, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Anova um, and recovered like, you know, AVA lay with Coelurosaurs, which includes Tyrannosauroids. And so to Dapper's point, it seems that there's discontinuity in um, how many differences are needed to make something a baromen, whether that's genetic or morphological or developmental. There's no single clear metric. It seems to vary kind of from group to group, depending on which characters you pick. Basically what he's saying. If I'm not mis misrepresenting that. Yeah. And also it is a little suspicious that it seems like the kinds that are recovered tend to get bigger in terms of diversity, the farther away they are from being similar to humans. So we have the absurdly narrow baromen of humans. Then we have the other baromen of pongids, which is usually what I see creationists use for the uh, non-human apes, despite the fact that humans fit very nicely within that group. And there's actually fewer gaps between humans and other apes than there are between say gorillas and say uh chimpanzees because we have essentially no gorilla fossil record and so mm -hmm. all we have are gaps um and then you'll see other people will say things like yeah frogs that's a that's a probably a kind it's like that's <laughs> all of an era yeah yeah um, that's that that's a whole lot of disparity so i guess my problem with creationist um studies about kinds are that they just seem to be extremely arbitrary and unsystematic. And then... So, um, so I, I kind of gave you a critique of, of some of these other uh, papers, but I, I'm not sure exactly how that particularly applies to this specific paper. I don't know well, if, if, you, if, you, if you're implying that the, the data sets of Berger and Dembo would be, would, wouldn't be suitable. We're not disagreeing or, with or their what? data set. Okay, because you did mention data sets being an issue I'm, I'm for some people. With, I'm it disagreeing with be, the idea that the technique not always. is able to recover the difference between two closely related groups that, for which you know exact morphological intermediates for the entire stage doesn't really work. Like between that and actually separate creations with no ancestry. Because let, let's just propose a hypothetical situation. Okay. Let's say that Australopithecus sediba is the founding population in a radiation that will become the homo genus because the homo genus wasn't, isn't just a linear progression according to evolutionary theory of one species to the next, right? There's a branching tree where different lineages go in different directions. And so let's say that Australopithecus sediba was a member of a line that while not initially very large, therefore not having a very large quantity of fossils to find, as a result of certain morphological adaptations resulted in the ability to have an adaptive radiation into the homo genus. I don't think you would get a different um, barometrological result from that situation, despite the fact that that situation negates the possibility of separate kinds, if it were true. And I don't know how you can disambiguate that with barometrological uh, processes, especially given that if you do it genetically, um, if you want to be consistent with humans and separate ancestry, you're going to have to have just kinds all over the place. I mean, there's going to end up being like 30 cat kinds at this point. Yeah, we did a, a video. Well, I, I didn't, we didn't do a video on that. Uh, a guy uh, who goes by Evo grad did a video on my channel about that and was like, if we're going to apply the 
uh, it was a response to uh, I think we're standing in raw mat actually. Like if, if we're going to apply the, you know, 1.5% difference or 2%, whatever it is between like humans and chimps, if we apply that to cats, yeah, it's, it kinds everywhere. You know, it's like everything except closely related right. species ends up being like a separate kind. But so. I, I mean, I mean, the, the counter to that then is that cats have simply diversified more than humans because they have a shorter generation time and you know they they reproduce much faster i'd be very surprised to see a, a study that is indicating cats have like a ridiculously faster um now that's not to say there there hasn't been slowdown in primates there has but to the extent that you would get like that much diversification uh differences between these lineages i would be very very interested to see uh a study on that but the sheer sheer amount of offspring that they bear i mean plays into all of that again that's not really getting you where you need to go in terms of genetic um differences right we're talking about mammals right i mean there's more uh, there's more op opportunities for mutations to occur and and thus diversity can happen quicker spe speciation can I, I would i would assume i mean I, I would quickly Theoretically, the, at least I mean, theoretically, I could say that maybe it's felids can speciate faster than uh, hominids, right? I, I don't think mm -hmm. that's necessarily a ridiculous idea. But the problem is that the reason that people can look at the genetics of felidae, right? So like Panthera, Anphilus, and all the other little uh, genera that no one, everyone forgets about, like the cloud leopard and the, the uh, cheetah and the puma and whatnot. That amount of difference is greater than the difference among extant hominids. And yet we can still say, okay, well, this is a common ancestry situation, despite the fact that we have differences in chromosome numbers. For instance, that's why lions and tigers tend not to be able to produce fertile offspring. Like, uh, I think it's like ligers are infertile, but tigons are occasionally fertile if they're female or something like that. Right, it's the, um, uh, what is it, Haldane's rule? Isn't that what it is? If you have the two... Um... The, the two X chromosomes or the two. Yeah. Something like those that. Are, yeah. Only those but are the so, ones. So we have things where it's like, okay, well, chromosome fusion and splitting is fine for felids. And we can have, you know, uh, low 90s percent similarity in alignable sequence uh, in terms of matching. But if we have a chromosome difference and we have, you know, a 99 to 9 or 98 to 99 percent in terms of uh, alignable sequence match in, say, two groups of, well, we'll say chimpanzees and humans, although it works for bonobos too. Mm -hmm. um, that's, mm, no, nah, that's probably not a real fusion, even though alignable segments of chimpanzee chromosome 2A and 2B actually do align to chromosome 2 in humans, even though there's a fusion site, even though there's telomere-specific uh, pseudogenes at the fusion site, even though we do have a lot more transitions than creationists ever predicted we would, because you got to remember, the prediction of creationism was, no, we're never going to find anything that's a transition between an ape and a, well, a quote unquote, an ape and a human. And yet, I mean, every single hominin fossil is a refutation of the original prediction of creationism. Well, I mean, creationists have had multiple views on the issue, as I said before, things like the great chain of being and, you know, kind of some creationist ideas of, you know, God creating kind of this whole spectrum ranging from what they would have thought was the lowest life all the way to humans, which they assumed was the highest life. They, okay, but they would have fair, thought that it would have been a perfect. We're, we're talking about I, I'm just saying that progressive creation or um, theistic evolution or the great chain of being, which falls into weird camps that kind of go between Christianity and Greek thought and stuff does, like yeah. that. So, but we're specifically talking about young earth creationism and perhaps I should have been more clear about that, but it is like, look, I've read scientific creationism and the Genesis flood and fossils or, or and evolution. Of the fossils still say, no, I know what the original claims were. And I know that these ideas about uh, Behrman's diverging from the Ark and the idea that, um, you know, oh, it's okay to find transitional fossils between that look like transitions between basal hominids and modern eight or modern homo sapiens. Those are areas that creationism has been backed into, not that it has gone on to embrace. Creationism fought tooth and nail against the idea that the giraffe might be related to anything else because they liked the design idea for like the neck. Sure. But now it's like, 
No, they're probably related to the old copy. Well, then that wasn't a design event with the neck. And it just seems to me like creationism keeps retreating. And at this point, you're sort of at the point where it's like, I'm not sure that it can retreat further without collapsing. And yet I don't see the trajectory of the additional evidence going in a direction other than forcing further retreats. But maybe that's just me. I mean, I, I you're saying basically that things which creationists would have once thought to be instances of, of special design are now considered to be either mutation or, or created heterozygosity. I mean, that's part of it. Um, it's certainly the case that neither created heterozygosity uh, nor special creation of species can actually explain all of the examples that creationists have loved to give throughout the years of design with also keeping the idea of like roughly family level kinds. So for right. instance, like the pandas thumb was often cited as an example of design by God. But if Ursidae is a kind, then either we have the absurdly non-parsimonious idea that the original bears from the Ark had pandas thumb and every mm. single lineage besides the pandas individually lost it. Or we have the idea that it wasn't a divine event, I'm sorry, a, a design event. Instead, it is actually the result of evolution, even though we're going to shunt it into a corner and call it microevolution, even though it actually is macroevolution. And this whole thing applies across the board. So it's, it's, we have all these things where like, oh, this human aspect had to be designed. It's like, well, you're in the same realm with hominins and humans as you are with the pandas thumb and other ursids, right? None of these traits is exceptional in terms of morphology that can't be explained genetically. In fact, and I, from a biblical perspective, I wouldn't even necessarily expect humans to be so different from other creatures simply because, you know, they're created on the sixth day of creation. According to the Bible, they're created to live in a garden, it, you know? So I think God, by creating humans on the sixth day was stressing our similarity to the other creatures created on that day uh, so that we could be good stewards and kind of understand um, kind of the needs of, of his other creatures. But kind of from that perspective, then um, I, I think what makes humans most unique, yes, I, I think that there are morphological discontinu discontinuity. There is discontinuity. Uh, I, I think the thing that makes humans most unique is their ability of, of language is, is their ability for abstract thought and, and those sorts of things. So from a gracious perspective, although I would expect at least somewhat of a morphological discontinuity, them to be morphologically discontinuous. I, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me isn't even the morphology. It is the, uh, yeah, it is more the mental capacity. Okay. But pushing back on that, that, really makes humans their own as in just homo sapiens their own kind doesn't it because we don't have erectus culture i mean we have like we have some tools right i mean but lots of animals make tools um and you see this gradient in terms of tool uh, industry complexity and you get up to like you know humans and then there's maybe neanderthals did art maybe Again, well, I mean, I don't there's things attributed to Homo erectus art as well. Okay. Is there? That's I, interesting. I'm not aware of that. I'm not exactly a hominin expert, but I would love to see, uh, to see that. Cause yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't heard aware. of that either. I'd heard, I'd heard about the arguments over Neanderthals. I had not heard about over Homo erectus. That is interesting. I mean, yeah. the most, the most ancient one would be the, 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 from the site of Trinil, right? Where, hmm. where uh, Eugene Dubois had that, uh, that shell with the, the carving on, on the on it um but sure. I, I believe there have been others since that time mm -hmm. i i saw one more recently and i i think there was evidence of pigmentation i, I can't remember exactly i thought that was, was neanderthal you're talking about like the the ochre right because i'd heard of there was like ochre um there is on neanderthals but i i'm, I'm pretty sure there was something with homo erectus okay i had not heard of that but again even still i'll i'll just say that's okay that's the way it, you know there is uh, erectus art. Okay, but 
that still only pushes us back to Erectus, right? Well, absolutely, and I, we still I think have that's that... a problem, right? Because the fossil record is is more and more fragmentary kind of the, fur the further back we go, right? Uh, huh, interesting. The nature of the layers. But... I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, see, see, my, one of my issues is, okay, for example, burial. The only creatures we've ever had burial proved is in the genus Homo. The only creatures that seem to have been talking are in the genus Homo. The only creatures using It depends fire. on how you define talking. Because bats talk uh, with each other, birds okay. talk with each other. I mean, like, human it's not. Speech. Is it uh, the human syntax? Speech is unique. I'm well, with sure. You on this I'll, one. No, I yeah. absolutely agree with that. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I did a video on it, uh, the Cro-Magnon's tale, where I talk about this. Absolutely, human hmm. speech is, or no, sorry, that was the Urgas tale. Um, is is definitely unique in terms of syntax compared to, you know, bat cries and and bird chirps and things like that. But. My my concern here is, in order to be a genus, you must have unique features. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to pick the unique features of genus Homo and say that those are the unique features that make genus Homo the special boys of animals. Because I could point to you know, but any I think single... those are things that are that set humans apart from everything else. That's right. what he's in said. This is true of anything behaviorally. <laughs> In order to be a valid genus, right, you must have okay. unique aspects of your biology. And every single genus right. has these things. Right. So pointing out genus Homo has un things unique to them that are un unmatched anywhere else in the animal kingdom is actually not to say something special about genus Homo. It's simply to explain why it's a genus on its own. If like, mm -hmm. or, or think about like assassin bugs, for instance, there in I can't think of any other bugs besides assassin bugs which kill ants and then pile them on their back to pass as ants in the ant mound. Completely okay. unique. No other animal yeah. does this. There, there, I'm not aware of any other animal does that. And uh, yeah, there are no other like animals with trunks to the same extent as like elephants. There are no other two leaf plants like Wawichia out there or things like chameleons. Or I was actually just reading a paper on convergent evolution like yesterday. So these are all in the front of my mind. But yeah, there's lots and lots and lots of things that are totally unique in terms of right. organismal diversity. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of, I, I, I don't really understand. Like you'd have to argue that each of those is each of those totally unique. Cause the modern elephants are like within the, you know, the kind proboscidae, but that means they are, yes, sir. Uh, proboscidea, but they, um, they clearly evolve. If they're within proboscidea, right then that means they descended from ancestors who didn't have these features to the same extent that they do. Like Meritherium just didn't have the trunk that modern African elephants have, right? Mm -hmm. So. I mean, from a biblical perspective, we would expect humans to be unique because from all these features that we wouldn't expect that the the features that are seen in humans in terms of cognition and everything are things that can evolve right why not yeah because it does evolve though because i i believe that those things are connected to the soul okay so we have so for instance nobody in here is in disagreement over the fact that humans have cognition to an extreme degree relative to all other organisms no one here is, mm -hmm. is disputing that point mm -hmm. but well, plus That's, Ceratosaurus. <laughs> Obviously, of course. Right. Um, but that also has to be the case, or it also has has to be the case that other organisms have evolved cognition relative to their ancestors, like corvids and parrots and elephants and cetaceans, right? And I want to specify that with the um, parrots, because remember, at least one major uh, creationist group has cetacaformes, not just parrots, but the entire, like, what is that a super order that's uh that's like falcons and parrots isn't it yeah. attack as, yeah as a single kind so we're saying that the absurdly intelligent african gray parrot shares a common ancestor with the relatively dumb eagle because eagles are not that smart mm -hmm. so it seems like cognition is a thing that can evolve and since it is definitely the case that various organisms can evolve to become the most thing for instance there's a particular falcon that is the fastest bird in fact mm -hmm. i believe it's actually the fastest animal known but it seems to have evolved from something that was not the fastest animal known 
and we also have within that same quote unquote kind animals of vastly different abilities in cognition. And we even have that in primates, right? Like we, we know that some species of apes are smarter than other species of apes. And they're also themselves generally smarter than most non-ape monkeys. And monkeys are generally smarter than say prosimians like lemurs or lorises. So it, it doesn't seem like we're at a point where intelligence is like the thing that can't evolve. It seems like even under creationist models, it has certainly evolved. From, from my perspective, I see a number of things about the human fossil record, which I think are in line with what we'd expect from creationism. I mean, we've, we've been talking about the morphologic, you know, discontinuity and everything. I, I think that's an aspect. I also think that um, the inbred nature of, you know, various human species is, is another thing that we would expect from creationism uh, i i really do not see how you how you're getting the evolution of cognition in, in humans but um I, I really don't see anything about that that necessarily refutes creationism if you if you know what i mean like i i see that i, I you have do a point, but i don't see that that necessarily well, is that, that swings back around to the thing that i i don't think there is a refutation condition for creationism i don't think that it is scientific to the point where it does actually have a falsification condition. And I base this in part on um, uh, actually Todd Wood's ideas in his, I guess, article, uh, Evolution of Theory Not in Crisis, where he says that there is, in fact, not really a model for creationism that is sufficiently robust. And that um, he also does say that there is, in fact, good evidence for evolution. And to me, I take this to a large extent as a tacit admission that yeah, evolution is is the science. We believe this thing and we're hoping to make it scientific. But simply the fact that we don't actually have the ability to do so right now isn't actually dissuading us when it should. It, it should absolutely dissuade someone that their ideas, while being bandied about as if they were scientific, don't have falsification conditions. As far as I can tell, have never actually made a prediction about biology that is one distinguishable from the prediction of evolution and two actually confirmed. Um, and that I'm not aware of anyone who's ever now this is not a formal logical thing. This is sort of a heuristic, but I'm not aware of anyone who was convinced of the evidence of young earth creationism and then became a Christian or a Jew because I do know some young earth creationist Jews. Instead, I know of a lot of people who have become Jews or Christians of a particularly conservative variety, and then later decided, oh, I guess the evidence does comport with creationism. So those three things taken together make me gravely concerned for the idea that creationism could in any way be considered scientific at, at this point. I mean, I, I would kind of say that kind of, <laughs> I mean, in, in terms of evolution, some of my biggest issues with your ideas would be the origin of the universe and the origin of life, which Those I've never seen. Nothing in... to do with evolution. Yeah. Okay. Any, you understand any what origin... I'm saying, though, in terms of kind of this not, debate. Not really. It's often I being mean... framed between evolutionists and creationists, and thus it's somewhat of a useful term, even though obviously, you know, we both believe well, in see, evolution to some extent. I'm not a physicist, right? I have, I really don't have any position on the origin of the universe. Um, I, I just don't. If it was Big Bang, fine. If not, okay. Um, it doesn't really matter to me either way because the things that I study are way, way afield of the Big Bang and all. Right, different and, and mine too. So I obviously, right. yeah, exactly. And so right, and I agree. Like right now, I the issue I think that's the biggest one in this conversation is human common ancestry, mm -hmm. and the fact is that even if the universe were divinely created. And even if life were divinely created, that none of that negates human con common ancestry with other apes. So it's a separate issue that is also important. And I do want there to be good science done on things like the origin of life and the origin of the universe, even if I'm not as familiar with it as I am with other parts of science, that's okay. I can't know all of science and I have a weirdly eclectic scientific knowledge base as it is. So I don't need to you know, go crazy with that, but if we're talking, which I think we are still, primarily about things like um, kinds, especially within Animalia, and human common ancestry with other animals like the apes, 
um, to bring up the Big Bang, which really is unrelated. I mean, there might be some kind of philosophical relation, but certainly not a scientific one. I think is a little bit, um, I just don't think it's entirely appropriate. I, would, I don't want to say like it's- It's not relevant. Like a, yeah, it's just, it's Sorry. sort of just yeah. a distraction. Okay, here, I have a question for you. What do you think is a prediction of evolution in regards to hominids that um, evolutionists have made that is not compatible with what the Bible would teach? Oh, I mean, the fact that, like, uh, I mean, the, the idea that, that um, humans and the other great apes share common ancestry, right? This has been around since Linnaeus. He was a creationist, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the fact that once genetic sequencing came out, and once all these fossils came out, and this seems, I'd say the fact that, that uh, Darwin predicted there would be a fossil record of humans, right? And we have a good chunk of that now. Um, obviously, none of them could have predicted genetics, but I would say that that now that we have an understanding of how genetics works, right? Uh, it we would predict that uh, the more closely related we are to something, the more genetic commonalities we would have with that thing, and that's also been borne out. We are more similar to chimps and gorillas than to anything else on the planet right and wouldn't it just be easier if these were separate kinds to just not have dna one of them could have dna one could have rna as its genome or some other nucleotide that we can't even conceive of wouldn't it just be easier to do it that way that would be pretty strong evidence of se separate ancestry no, i do want to say one of the things thing. that you just brought up necessarily preclude young earth creationism I mean, you can ad hoc slide Young Earth creationism into any argument. I mean, I guess because yeah. we we listen to uh, not willingly, but uh, standing for truth and those guys, and they come up with a lot of ad hoc assertions to justify arguments that do not readily fit into their quote models, right? So, so I, you can. I've, oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, never. I have a couple things. One, I I don't really like the way the question is framed as. Um, because I don't think that young earth creationism is the only way to seriously take the Bible. I happen to know a lot of very serious Christians who do not take it that way. I have several of them on my channel regularly. Um, so I, I don't like saying that what predictions of evolution contradict the Bible, because I don't think we can say with sufficient certainty what Genesis is trying to tell Christians and Jews, because, you know, those are the two people who really care about it, or two groups of people, I should say. Um, and to a lesser extent, Muslims, but they're sort of wishy-washy on exactly how important, uh, you know, the Old Testament or even the New Testament is. Anyway, um, so I don't like that framing, uh, because I think it ignores the experience of other Christians. Um, but also, uh, there's a pretty big one, which is um, that in one of the best ways to test common ancestry that actually even works when we don't find common ancestry, like what happens in viruses, is we have certain areas of the genome that are called uh, neutral variation or unconstrained areas, which is not to say that they're not functional, they don't do anything, that's not what that is. But what it means is that exactly what's in there isn't terribly important. So you have a few different kinds, you have things like um, parts of the genome that are just there to space out different genes. Uh, you have parts of the genome that um, where you can flip back and forth between synonymous uh, codons, and that doesn't matter uh, because you still end up with the same protein at the end of the day. Because if it's a synonymous codon, it can't change the genotype, or sorry, the phenotype, if you change that part of the genotype. Um, and even in these things, we find similar, essentially identical nested hierarchy in just the non constrained regions of the genome of basically anything we care to examine that we find when looking at the constrained parts. And the important thing there is that there's no particular reason, uh, aside from literal genetic descent, to have those similarities in there in the unconstrained part of the genome. So that I think, so part of the problem with young earth creationism in terms of not being compatible is when you have an omnipotent person who can do literally, literally anything, I don't think that that ends up being falsifiable. But it's certainly not a prediction that I can see being in any way associated with the idea of separate ancestry. Um, but yeah, I don't think we're actually gonna give an example of something that could not be shoehorned into 
having an omnipotent person who can literally arrange anything to look like anything. But when it comes to science, we have to go with the explanation that one makes predictions and that two is somewhat parsimonious and that three at least has options for falsification as opposed to young earth creations, which like I said, I mean, once you introduce omnipotence, there's literally no way to falsify it. It's a really big problem in terms of scientific uh, legitimacy when you just toss in an omnipotent entity. I mean, in in some ways, then that is more of kind of a, a, a feature of omnipotence than, than really a, a, an issue with omnipotence. Um, mm, not I, in terms of like an actual but I see your thing. point there. I, I certainly understand your point that um, I think in terms of the specific models that creationists are coming up with, they are falsifiable. For example, by, by the work I've done, I mean, you could, if you can show that, you know, these creatures don't separate out into groups, that is falsifiable. So, but we don't we don't expect that necessarily to be the case on evolution either, though. And that's what right. That's a non distinguishable to, prediction. We've tried to intimate that, um, like with my example with the butterflies, you can have discontinuity there, right? It, we don't expect, and we only have a limited number of fossils, right? We we've, we've been trying to, or we've been saying that, right? We don't necessarily expect everything to be totally gradual in evolution, and if you also don't expect everything to be totally gradual in creationism, then this isn't a prediction for either camp. Right. Right. That's just what everyone expects to see. And also in terms of uh, omnipotence being a feature, once you start invoking omnipotence as an explanation for things that don't otherwise fall into what into line with what you would expect, your idea becomes functionally indistinguishable from last Thursdayism, which is just the belief that, you know, the omnipotent creator of the universe created the universe last Thursday. So a week ago, or you know, just, what was it, a few days ago, because I, I can't remember what day of the week it is. About, Time apparently. is relative. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Time is made up. So, but yeah, the, the omnipotent creator of the universe made up the universe last Thursday. And everything that you think indicates otherwise is just his clever creation to make it seem like the universe pre-existed that. And at that point, like, we're, we're just in the realm of complete well, made up nonsense where nothing I, matters I, and you can say anything you want. And you have I, God I, on your I side. So you just go for it. I don't think that's the same thing because from... A biblical perspective we are bound to what the bible says and the bible obviously doesn't say you know that the universe was created last thursday so yeah i think yeah but that's just are... god tricking you into thinking the universe is older well then that would negate god because god is a god of truth so if god but has lied him saying then... that is still part of him tricking you into thinking the universe is older sorry what did you say you you thinking that God is a God of truth who wouldn't lie to you because you read it in the Bible is also part of the entire charade that God did to make it seem like the universe existed longer than ago than last Thursday. See, that's the problem. There's literally nothing you can say that I can't cover with an omnipotent agent with any idea I care to come up with. I can come up with literally any idea and then invoke omnipotence and literally anything you say, I can wave away by saying omnipotence covers that. So when oh. you bring that into science, you cannot falsify the idea. Now, I agree. Creationism makes falsifiable ideas within the umbrella. So, for instance, you know, we have uh, Jensen's ideas about human chromosome diversity, which have already been falsified. We have genetic entropy, which has already been falsified. We have um, irreducible complexity, already been falsified. Well, great. But that didn't do anything to young earth creationism because it's fundamentally unfalsifiable at its core. It just makes these little side branches out that sometimes wither away because they were falsifiable. I mean, you, you're if what you mean is that creationism is ultimately based on faith and belief in God, I, I mean, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, the Heidelberg Catechism defines faith as a trust and belief that everything God has revealed in his word is true. And... I mean, if if that if your faith is incorrect, then obviously, I mean, yeah, that, that does cause issues. But ultimately, I am convinced of my faith, faith because I believe that God has 
worked in me and uh, made me to believe in him. And well, I'm not here to dispute that, right? My, no one's trying to make you an atheist here or anything like right. that. Right. My my long standing position in terms of other people's religious stances is that I am in no way interested in changing them, except where they may contradict established science. So only in those aspects am I ever interested in changing anyone's religious beliefs. I have no, I do not care to change your belief in God as a, as a whole. I don't care to change your belief in you know the salvific work of Christ on the cross and during His resurrection. I don't have any intent of trying to convince you away from the idea that, you know, Christians will go to heaven or, you know, be bodily resurrected because that is the older Christian belief or whatever. Like, I don't care. That's fine for all of that. However, there are certain aspects of certain branches of Christianity that are demonstrably false by any reasonable standard of evidence. And young earth creationism is in that. It's on the same footing academically as flat earth. Like, I think we have to acknowledge this. There is no actual peer reviewed anything that confirms young earth creationism over its opposition in terms of science. It isn't scientific. It is religious LARPing as science. And I know that that's harsh, but the fact that we cannot get real falsification criteria, the fact that we can't really get a satisfactory answer as to what barometrological studies would look like if evolution were true, all we can get is, well, I don't think there'd be as many gaps. Th these things add up to a field of study that isn't science. It's fundamentally pseudoscientific. Well, before you were talking about uh, exactly, you I'm, didn't think there was anything that you could basically bring up anything and creationism, you know, could just change to adopt basically any view. But I, I don't no, think- No, not any view, any evidence I would bring up. Also, I'm going to give us about five more minutes because we've okay. been at this for about an hour. So go ahead, Peter. Okay. If, if you could conclusively prove that humans and chimpanzees were related, there's no way, in my view, to accommodate that within the Bible. Uh, but I don't think there is evidence that I could produce that would convince the field of young earth creationism, no matter how much there was, no matter how conclusive it was, that that's the correct conclusion. There's no evidence I could bring. There are views that would falsify it if you accepted the view, but the problem is you don't have to accept the view because you can take a look at literally any evidence and find a reason to dismiss it, which is what has happened all over the place in creationism. <sighs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> I know I'm sounding harsh. I don't really mean to be. Yeah, I know. I, I know that yeah. we're not going to come to an agreement on this. I just... Sometimes I feel like it's it's not well expressed the degree to which it seems from basically the entirety of the scientific community and even just lay people looking from without at creationism. And I say this as a former creationist. It is hard to explain the degree to which it is not taken seriously for good reason by everybody. Do you want, can I share with you exactly why personally I'm a young earth creationist? Sure. Sure. Shoot. I, I think for me, I, I have, I have three reasons. Number one would be faith. I think fundamentally the Bible is incompatible with materialistic naturalism and kind of the whole idea of, I agree know, there. Well, yeah, I mean, but then working off of materialistic naturalism kind of the idea of evolution and then also cosmic evolution i and disagree it, there well i understand you do but i i don't think that it is fundamentally mentally compatible and whenever you try to do those things i i see huge issues on on either side when you try to combine the bible with that so the, the reason i disagree that evolution and cosmology and essentially all of the science that disagrees with young earth, young earth creationism, which is almost all of it, um, is not necessarily a philosophically naturalist endeavor is because one, a lot of the work is done by people who are not philosophical naturalists. And two, I don't see how methodological naturalism can therefore lead to the disconfirmation of supernaturalism from a philosophical standpoint, or can confirm the truth of 
uh, philosophical nationals. I don't see how those things could logically relate to each other in a way that actually means that science disproves God or that God means that you therefore cannot have the methodologically naturalistic explanations be true. Now, it's certainly the case that certain theologies wouldn't mix there. But I mean, even within Cre or sorry, even within Christianity, there is a wide range. And in fact, the majority of Christians do not agree that these ideas are incompatible. And especially since, you know, the Big Bang itself was proposed in roughly its modern form first by a Christian. Although perhaps you might not count Catholics as Christians, they're at least certainly not atheists. I think we can agree there. Whether or not they're Christians, they're definitely not atheists. So, th so that's one issue. I think the Bible is fundamentally incompatible with the idea of universal common ancestry and, and the Big Bang. And, and, and second of all, my second reason would be the whole issue of the, the origin of the universe. That is my, my second reason for why I'm a younger okay. creationist. I personally just see that as basically the single most fundamental aspect of reality that simply isn't explained so you remember i said i have no opinion on the big Bang, I, I understand right? i'm just trying to share yeah. with you why why i well sure i understand no, that's, I, I understand I understand that's why it's, it's personal for you but like i i just it does not matter to me like i've taken a couple of physics classes not a fan but uh sorry out there any physicists are watching uh jackson the one of these organ, days i'm the gonna explain to you chemistry. the microscopic cross-section for vision of thermonuclear uh, for, sorry thermal uh neutrons for uranium 238 it's gonna be a lot of fun i would rather die but You're also have to learn about angstroms but also like everything that i find you know just for me personally like everything that i find interesting right is just on this planet and you know all the the life that occurs on all the biodiversity and so yeah i understand that's a personal thing for you but like me as you know an evolutionist whatever i'm just like i don't care <laughs> but don't you think that's rather fundamental if if your own view can't even explain the origin of the universe don't you think that's a rather kind of fatal flaw i think there are lots of things that we can't or that no one well, on this planet can explain and that actually, so not really well to yeah, me suggests but, but, a question I, that i would like a follow-up what what do you think the view is here sorry are you saying what is your view right or? like it seems like I, I don't know that my view can't explain the origin of the universe, um, but also, even if it can't, which, again, I, I don't think anyone here knows my view, but even if it can't, that doesn't mean that other aspects of reality are, are well explained by my view. An analogy I've used before is, let's say that you saw on an icy road a car that had slid into the ditch and you saw like the tire tracks from where they lost control starting by a patch of black ice and you see the tree that they crashed into. And so you say to me, well, Dapper, I think that this person was driving and they got lost control because of this patch of ice, skidded off the road and landed in this ditch by the side of the road. And then I say, ah, but where was the car coming from in the first place? And if you can't explain that, then I don't see why I should take seriously your explanation of how it ended up in the ditch. So to some extent by saying, well, if we can't explain the origin of the universe, which again, I'm not conceding, I'm just saying for the sake of argument, even if that's the case, it doesn't mean that our ability to explain, say, the history of life is thereby lessened. Yeah, I agree well, with that. I mean, it, it does mean that there's a, a fundamentally flawed basis to kind of the well, materialistic, really. I mean, naturalistic material. You don't okay, necessarily yeah. need one to go to the other, right? Like, regardless of which model of universal origin is correct, that has no bearing on whether chimps are related to humans, right? right? And also, well, it isn't. But, I, but I, but what I'm doing here is I'm just sharing why I'm a young Earth creationist. Okay, but yeah. I, I want to point out that okay, well, it is it up, not Pepper. the case that okay, it is not the case that these ideas require philosophical naturalism. That's just what I'll say. So. <laughs> And it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine when people imply that it does, because um, I know so many people for whom that is not the case. Well, I understand that's not the case, but I don't think it's it's logically compatible. I mean, I there are people who okay. do that. I just don't think that that is a compatible view. I mean, they, there, there's I, I don't doubt that there are tons of Christians who believe in the Big Bang. I just don't think that's compatible with scripture. OK, Um all right. Well, it's been a little over an hour, so uh, 
other Peter is going to pull the plug. Um, so f- before he does that, though, I want to say uh, thank you both for coming. Thank you, uh, Paleo Logos, other Peter, for, <laughs> for coming on. Uh, oh, and Paleo Logos is linked in the description. Go subscribe. Yes, yes, he, Paleo Logos is linked in the I say this with absolutely no disingenuous. Dis, disingenu- I'm not being disingenuous. Gosh darn it, English. He um, has some excellent content that you should absolutely take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed talking to you both. Uh, yeah, I I think we, we have some fundamental kind of disagreements about the nature of kind of reality, but uh, it was definitely enjoyable to kind of speak with you, hear your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again, Dapper, for coming on. And uh, I try. thank you, Peter, going to go for it, uh, for producing our show as always. We wouldn't be here without you. You're At least well- I wouldn't. I don't know about these guys, but I wouldn't. You're welcome. So, and thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching this video, but before you go, I'd like to take a minute to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Ben Tovind, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Chris Love, Landed Knoll, Sphincter of Doom, and Patrick Dennis. Without the help of the people whose name you see on screen right now, this channel simply wouldn't exist. If you'd like to join the team, there's links in the description to my Patreon, as well as a join button right below this video that will allow you to join on YouTube. Joining gets you access to an exclusive Discord server, early access to my videos, often more than a month in advance, as well as other perks depending on how much you decide to pledge. However, if a monthly or annual pledge isn't for you, there are other ways to support the channel, including a merch store down in the description. And hey, just liking and sharing this video always helps a lot. Thank you very much. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thank you.